Today we're going to talk about permissions because it's all about permissions, permissions, permissions. Uh, one thing I do want to add, though, is that um, in the last Ignite that we were there, Ignite sessions, there was such an explosion of new uh, environment level permission managements that are going to coming out, releases. And, and I, I want to thank all the product groups for that because right now Power Apps is being leveraged at such a high enterprise level customers as well. Um, and they gave a lot of feedback that we need these levels of permissions, these gaps of permissions need to be filled. And I believe all those gaps are going to be filled after all these announcements that were made. So I just, I just wanted to, I don't want to digress too much, but I do want to call that out. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is permissions. And, the, the, you know, for me, people call me as I'm consciously optimistic. I'm also the kind of guy who says security first, performance later. That is all true about me. I would like to set something up, which is secure right from the get go. And then after that, I don't have to worry about it. So what I'm going to do today is in the you know in the short period of time, I'm actually going to tell you how I can handle permissions at the service level, which is the power platform service, Power Apps, Power Automate, at the environment level and at the app level, specifically on the app is inside the app, at the controls, and at the app outside over there. All right? So let's jump in and take a look at some of the, um, the demos I already have for you. Now here is an app, and it's a timesheet app. One of the ways I've set this up is that inside the app, normally there is a button over here for you to go ahead and enter your timesheet. But I've gone ahead in that control, I've set up some functionalities and formulas such that if you are a person working, which this is your start time and this is your end time, and if you don't show up at that time, you can't open up this app and put in a, you know, your, the, your start time and your end time. And it's actually very simple how I was able to accomplish that. So let me just show you what, what was some of the tricks to it. So when I come in over here, Normally, there would actually be a button, and then that button over here, it would actually come in, and would, you know this button would say, this is your start time. But one of the first things I've done is right at the app loading, when the app on start happens over here, I've got a simple variables. You know, over here, the, the variables, which is go ahead and get me what is the login user. Make that call one time, and I've already got the login user over there. But what I'm also doing is the user who has logged into the app, who is using the app, I am going and taking the email, which is a very unique identifier for that user. I'm grabbing that email address and I'm doing a check against a list. It could be a SharePoint list, it could be a CDS entity. Oops, I said entity, it's CDS table now. Um, it's the CDS table, your SQL, whatever, whatever is the backend you have over there. Um, you go ahead and reference it over there. So here's what I did. I got a SharePoint list over here, quick and easy. Um, and I've got a list running, which is basically telling me the employee name, the days of the week, and then the hours of the start and end time. This is it, this is my table in the back end over here. And so when the app opens up, again, on the app on start, I go ahead and fetch the information for that user and I grab the date over there. Now, based on that date information that I get, I've gone ahead and put in this little formula to say that, hey, if, if as long as the, the start time and the end time falls between like an hour increment, because you, you gotta be practical, right? Somebody may actually be up to an hour late. So as long as they fall into that hour limitation, go ahead and display the button over there. Uh, but if that hour you know, time span has, has uh, elapsed, then go ahead and hide the button. So it's actually a very simple logic to go ahead and put in this visible functionality over there and um, you know, running it against over there. So now, now what happens is, well, obviously employees change their routine, holiday season's coming up, whatever. Very simple. You don't have to be a developer to go make any changes. The everyday manager, supervisor, or, you know, can come over here and says, "Okay, yeah, this is pretty simple, straightforward. Um, Daniel is going to be working overtime during the holiday season, so I just got to make sure that he is yes for all these other dates as well. And he's going to put in some 12-hour shifts. Let me go ahead and change that from 8 to 17 to, you know, like 8 to what is 8, whatever, you know, the 12 hours over there. Just change that. Very simple place to go ahead and do that stuff over here. And I know you guys who are on this call are probably more savvy than I am. You might even find a way to just take this data, put it into the app, and for the app, you can go ahead and make the changes over there. Kudos to you guys. That's completely possible on that way over there. So I want to switch gears now because we talked at the inside of the app level, right? At the control level. That's the first level of permissions that we can handle. Now let's just look at the app itself. Now I know most of you already do this, but I still want to talk about it is that at the app, there's several ways to give permissions to the app. Uh, one of them is I can actually go into the app, I can go to the share, and in the share, I can add all the users over there. 
and that usually works great from a small, you know, a, 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 a um, you have a department over there, you've got five, six people in the department, that's great. You go ahead and put that in, you, you, know, you share the app at the user level, it all works. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that the users have access to the backend database over there. In my case, I've got to make sure that the users also have access to the, the SharePoint uh, list over there. So that's you know one of the backend things that have to happen. But once all the backend database is it's taken care of, you can go ahead and actually even see how um, you know the app is configured. Because over here in the app, I've used a security group. Now, first tip tip I want to give you, so I'm going to be throwing a lot of tips out there. I personally, when I set up a security group, do it at the Azure AD. Don't go do it at, at the Microsoft 365 admin over there. Azure AD just helps to do take, uh, look at a lot more properties over here. So I always do mine at the Azure AD over here. So I come over here into the security groups, and this is when I, I mean, I go into the Azure AD, I go into the groups, and I go and I create a new group. I go ahead and create a security group, and this is how I personally do my naming convention because at the at the broader ent ent um, tenant level. When either you are the global admin, or you are, you know, or you're, or you're putting in a ticket request to your um, uh, Azure team, tell them that I'm putting in the request for Power Apps, but you are the one responsible for putting in that security group name. So when it comes to a app, say it is an app, and this is why I've gone ahead and done that. I've actually gone ahead and said that PA for Power Apps, and it is a timesheet app dash SG. Now this is the the uh, you know the the syntax I use. You can put the SG before, after, whatever. Come up with a naming convention that makes sense to you, and that's how we want to use it over there. See, I've I've come up with the different flavors. I've done PA, I've done Power Apps, whatever works for you. But make it kind of very user friendly. I personally use the Kiss technique, K I S S. Keep it simple, stupid. That's what I do. It just works for me. Now, so we went ahead and did that, and then that one is assigned right into the app level over here, all right? Now let's switch gears because we took care of the controls inside, we took care of the apps. Now I'm gonna go and take it to the next level is at the environment level. So at the environment level, you've gotta be the power platform admin over there. And, and I wanna stop and talk about that because many people think that they are, they're the power platform admin. And the reason they think that is because they say, well, I can come in over here and I can go to the settings gear over there and I can go to the admin center and I am the power platform admin. Um, remember, when you log in, everybody logs in as the maker. But if you are not the admin, you're not going to see a lot of stuff away. You might only see access to your things. But one of the big things that you will not see is you won't see the default one over there. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Make sure that when you're starting to work with the uh, the Power Platform and uh, sections over there, have access. Be, be very confident that you're the Power Platform admin. And to do that is you go into the Azure AD, you go and look at the security roles over there and add yourself to the Power Platform admin. And I've got a whole bunch of videos just on that topic. All right, coming back to the discussion I had. So I'm going to go back over here to the Power Platform Admin. My app was in this environment over here, so I'm going to click on that. And now at the environment level, I've gone ahead and added a security group. What does that mean? What that means is that people in this security group have, ac have access not only to the environments, but those are the people who can be also the makers uh, and the admins to that environment. It's a very important thing for you to know that because what happens is many times if you've gone ahead and created an environment, and if you haven't assigned a security group, then everybody has access to that environment. Now, when I say that, some people freak out about it. This is, well, what do you mean? Everybody has access to everything in the environment? It's like, no, 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 no. They don't have access to everything. What they do is they have access to get into the environment over there. In the environment level, all they see is all you've given them access to, which means they could come into an environment and it could be blank, or they would just see those you know, the out of the box templates apps over there, but they would not be able to see your app. However, they have the door to walk into that. So kind of keep that in mind. But if you've gone ahead and put in a security group over here, then that's the access way to get into that environment. Now let me pause over here and answer this one question because whatever is always this, this misconception people have is that, um, well, do people need to be in that security group to even use the app? And the answer to that is no. As long as the users have the access to the data source in the back end, and as long as the users have basically just the link to the app, they don't need to be part of that security group to use the app. Only the makers and the environment admins need to be in part of that security group. So it's a very important feature that you need to understand is that users don't need to be part of the security group, it's the makers and the admins, right? So we covered the environment level. Now, finally, let's switch over and look at the entire tenant level. Now, the tenant level, I can go back into the uh, 
Azure AD over here, and there's a couple of things we need to do. Tenant level usually boils down to licenses. Now, in the licenses, there's always these questions that come up to me is that, Daniel, in order for them to use permissions and things like that, do I need to give them you know, this level of access? Like if you're doing any E3s or you're doing E5s, the ball, the ball boils down to the data source. What are the connectors that you're using? And based on that, you can go ahead and use it. So a lot of common things I've seen is a lot, there's a lot of business type of uh, licenses. There's a lot of enterprise type of licenses, and they do a lot of mixing and matching. Now, the moment you start hitting premium connectors, that's where you got to go into a higher licensing level. But all said and done, when you come in over here, you go ahead and basically go to your users, and in your users, you go ahead and assign the licenses over there. But there's another licensing thing which you can handle at the tenant level. And when I go in, and I'll show it to you, I come back over here, I go into the licenses, there is something called as self-service sign-up products. Now, in the self-service final products, by default, there is all of these uh, products already set up over there. Now, if you have a scenario where if your user is part of the Power Apps, and now that you just want to make sure that that user doesn't have part of any of the Power Apps, on the Power Apps side, well, actually, on, on both the sites, specifically on the Power Apps side, initially, when this is a brand new user, that user just cannot get into the Power Apps if no license is assigned. In fact, they, a pop-up comes up saying you can go ahead and have a trial, and if you subscribe for the trial, then you can use that. On the Power Automate, it actually automatically assigns to you a trial license over there. If you want to completely block that, this is where you come into the Azure AD, and then you go ahead and take something off. Now, a very, very important thing, if in fact that you don't listen to anything, listen to this, is that this only works once. Uh, after a user has been using this for a while and you go take this off, the users usually still have access to at least the default environment, even if you take all of these off. Now, there's other ways to go ahead and make sure that you know you even block that. Uh, one of them is just disable their accounts altogether if the employees left the company. But this is basically the final level over here, is that if you don't even want users to have self-service, go ahead and take this off. But if a user has been using it for a while, this may not always work for you. And I'm always saying it may because you, know, you could customize your permissions at that level. So as an overview, this is basically all that we accomplished over here. We went ahead and talked about it from a self-service standpoint, uh, right at the service level. We went ahead and talked about it at the environment level. Uh, at the environment level, I was said that um, you know you all we can work it out on the permissions over there. We had a security group tied to the environment. Inside the environment, I had an app. On the app itself, I used a security group, and then even inside the app, when it comes to controls, I can use it based on you know, either a database over there, which whatever is the database is in the back end, or you could even use securities inside the app over there. And I'm going to leave that as a whole separate discussion altogether. So this is just a quick overview of how you can handle permissions. And remember, it's all about permissions, permissions, permissions. That's all I got, man. Talk. Great overview, Daniel. That's for sure. And like you said, that is a total overview, right? I mean, when you really start digging into the weeds on some of these things, there's a whole lot more to learn. I know you have a lot of videos on that. I've got a couple. I'm trying to think who else does. I think Reza put together a security permission video too. Lots to learn there. Thanks for the great overview and crash course at the different level here where you can apply it. 